Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. Meditation doesn't have to be sitting still and having an empty mind. The journey is such a beautiful thing because we are all on a journey. You want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, or at least have an idea of it, because you can make this really amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends. Old Hollywood is still intact. Every horse runs hard, but when they win, And they know it. They've got this little sass about them. It was pretty rough. I had to go into the water and with my med pack, swim to the beach, treat these guys, put them on my back, swim out to the helo. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen those before. And I said, what are those? And before I could even finish the sentence, she said, oh my God, you didn't touch them, did you? Even if monarchs go away and we never see one again, because there never will be monarchs again if they die out, it is just a little indicator of larger threats My dad said, so what were you guys doing in the desert? And I said, we were taking nude photos. (laughs) Hey, everybody, welcome back and happy new year. I hope that this episode finds you healthy and happy. I really needed that short break just to regroup and prepare for all of the exciting things that I have for you this year. I'm still eating with a keto oriented mindset. And um, so, you know, the scale dipped, but then I indulged over New Year's um, or on New Year's Eve and it went up and it's returned to its descent and it's all good, right? Like nothing static. And if there's one thing that will teach you humility and build some temperance, It's health-oriented eating. And also, I've been doing a lot of experimenting in the kitchen. I love cooking and especially making new things, making plates look really pretty and, of course, taste really good. So now that I'm really focusing on keto, I have replaced all of my sugars in the kitchen with Uh, sweeteners that are calorie free like monk fruit there's stevia in there there's erythritol allulose so I've got all of these different sweeteners in there and also the flowers so I don't have the white flour anymore I'm using almond flour coconut flour it's really cool because I get to be kind of a scientist with my favorite recipes, converting them into foods that taste really good. So I made this phenomenal, completely sugar-free, gluten-free, because gluten is in white flour, not in the almond flour or the coconut flour, carrot cake. And I'm telling you, everybody who's tasted it loved it. You know, I told them what it was and they loved it. It's so good. And I even made keto dulce de leche. So that's that, you know, you take the sweetened condensed milk normally and you cook it for a real, bake it for a really long time. And what my grandma used to do, which scares the heck out of me, is that she would put it in a pot of boiling water and boil it for like two hours without opening the can. I know a lot of people do that. And to me, it's like I'm waiting for the explosion to happen in the kitchen. So I don't think it's all that safe. The way that I would do it in the past is I would pour the dulce de leche into a small pan, like a glass Pyrex loaf pan. And then I would bake it for a couple of hours. And it was the same exact result without me having a complete heart attack and, you know, being stressed out for a couple of hours, which is like the worst thing ever. But anyway, I made this keto dulce de leche for alfajores, which are these incredibly delicious, very delicate Argentinian cookies. And these turned out really good. Of course, they are not exactly the same. I'm using sugar-free sweeteners, And actually, the dulce de leche, when I made it, because it had butter in there, and I think I'm going to try to make it with coconut oil next time, but because it had butter in there, it when it was warm, it tasted like butterscotch. I stuck it in the fridge, it thickened up, and now it tastes more like dulce de leche, like that butterscotchy flavor went away. But regardless, these were really great little sandwich cookies. 
anyway, that's where I am with that. Um, one of the things that I am going to be doing this year, now that I gave you all of that background, and this is based on your requests, is to make individual episodes for what's going on in my life, and then other episodes for in the company of friends conversations. And I think that will streamline things a little bit more so we can see how it goes, right? I have this great handwritten quote in my studio of something that I don't know, I, I don't remember where I saw it. I don't know if I read it or if I heard it somewhere. But it immediately made me go, aha, you know what, things don't need to be perfect. That's not the key. But what is the key is doing and improving, right? So it's this quote that not just that, but that, you know, we're constantly learning. So it's okay to go back and have redos. It's okay if things don't work out, because you can redo it, like nothing's fatal. And the quote is life is a simulation. So I'm excited to see how this iteration of the Queen Trail podcast goes. In the meantime, let us get on with the show. My first talk of 2023 is with my dear and hilarious friend, Justin Ezzy. He is a stand-up comic, a musician, a mad scientist, a writer, a retired science teacher, and a bringer of happiness. He's got so many projects that just make people smile, including, and I just love that he does this, he plays at memory care centers throughout the South Bay, just bringing joy back to some patients who might not even be able to talk at this point. But music does something to the mind that connects people again. And that's, you know, that's kind of like what life is all about. We just want to connect with each other. Like that's what this podcast is about, connecting. So I just love that he's doing that. He is a pro at making people laugh and building community. So please grab a cuppa and join me and Ezzy, as his friends call him, in today's In the Company of Friends talk. Enjoy. We did right. it. I'm so excited. Yes. I have the Esmeister, Justin Ezzy on, who is a super, super talented person. Oh, stop it. Oh, you are. <laughs> he is a former science teacher, and is still probably a mad scientist, a comedian, <laughs> a writer, a musician. I mean, you name it, you just do it all. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm laughing because it's just kind of funny. Go ahead. <laughs> what were you gonna say? It's I'm humble. true. It's tr- well, it's true. Um, yes, it when- is. So I'm going to probably start with your comedy because uh-huh. you are hilarious. Thank when you. did you get an inkling that, when did you start to get that inkling that you were funny? You know what's interesting about that? I had a friend of mine say to me uh, recently, within the last two years, he goes, he calls me as he goes, you know, when as he hears something funny, he just has to share it with everybody. He, he was talking about my cousin and he goes, you know, he knew her in high school and her name's Lolly. And he goes, Hey, you know, Lolly, she's, she was a real baby. She's still a bitch. <laughs> and that just cracked me up because she can be a little edgy at times. So I told her that he was embarrassed. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, that's the way you are. He says, you hear something funny. You just have to tell everybody. So that's kind of the answer to your question, when I hear something that's funny, I just have to tell everybody that I, cause I think it's funny and I want to share it, you know? So that's kind of where it all started, I think for me, but I've always loved, you know, I, I remember being a kid watching the Ed Sullivan show. I don't know if many of your <laughs> listeners remember Ed Sullivan, but uh, uh, they would have like mm-hmm. a singer on there, you know, and I was a musician and like, I didn't care about the singer. I didn't care about the guitar player. I wanted to see the comedian, you know, it was like, I just loved these guys like, you know, Jackie Mason or George Carlin and these guys, it's like, how do they do that? That's just fascinating. It's hilarious, you know? So, and plus I think comedy is so spontaneous. Like you either laugh or you don't laugh, you know, it's not like a song, you hear a song and after the song you might hear like, oh, that was real nice. You know, you know, it just seems more emotive. I guess the word is, it springs out. Right. 
when it strikes you, when it strikes the audience as hilarious, you do kind of get an excitement about, you know, what's the next thing that this person's going to say because it's so hilarious. It's, you know, the warm fuzzies. I know I had gone to a brain seminar a while ago and the doctor that was talking talked about two different things. One was laughing and Mm -hmm. how laughing just produces these endorphins and serotonin. And it's so good. You know, you've read all of the articles probably Mm because they're out all the time about how good laughing is for you. And so there was this whole conversation about how laughing opens Mm -hmm. up the lungs and it lets more oxygen in and it creates all of these different hormones. But also the second thing was how comedy is not something that hits people Mm -hmm. straight across the board, especially it's kind of like a cultural thing, you know, like English comedy is really dry. And if you're able to understand other languages, you know, Spanish comedy is very, um, what would I call it? There's a, Mm -hmm. there's a simplistic quality to it. That is Mm -hmm. funny. I don't mean that in a terrible way at all. Um, you know, the, the banter goes with the culture and what's funny in American comedy might not be funny in mm-hmm. Spanish comedy or in English comedy and vice versa. So I thought that was really interesting how it's, it's culturally attuned. Mm, I never thought of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Hey, but you know, don't you think that the shortest distance between two people is like a smile. I've always felt that. Like if let's say you go into a supermarket, you know, <laughs> and somebody's, you know, a checkout person or somebody working, you know, like in the fruit department, you know, and you go up to them and you say something and, you know, they give you a response. But then if you say something and there's a smile engaged, you both engage in a smile. That's like, that's just so beautiful. You know what I mean? That's the shortest distance I've always found between two people. It is. So, it is. It creates yeah. a deeper connection with that person. And it's immediate too. As soon as that smile comes in, you're kind of like friends now. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, comedy Mm -hmm. is great. So when you were a kid, you studied the comics? Uh, no, that started like when I was in um, college, you know, I just started studying it really hard with like, I I used to love, (laughs) this is funny. I used to love Woody (laughs) Allen's, his early records and I had them and it would be so funny. Every time somebody would come to visit me at the house, you know, I lived in a dorm room or wherever it was in a house with a bunch of guys, everybody that would visit me had to listen to this record. It was like, <laughs> once again, don't you think this is funny? This is so funny. Isn't it? You know, you know, so. I mean, there was one line he, he, he did in one of his routines. And this was struck me as funny. He goes, Oh, this is not, no, this is a different joke. This is one of the first jokes I ever heard. This was, um, I can't think of the guy's name. He was a famous Jewish comedian. I can see his face, but I can't think of his name. They were doing like a news report and he said, you know, today in the news, they found that a woman has a baby every three minutes here in the United States. And I go, we need to find that woman and make her stop. <laughs> <laughs> God. And I thought, that's so clever. Oh, my God, I love right. that, you know, because it's just like that non sequitur thing that's it's funny, right? Called a right turn, right angle turn. What am I thinking of? Yeah. You know, I'm trying to find something on my phone. I'm trying to find like a laugh track. So, you know, this doesn't so, sound so dry. <laughs> So funny. Yeah. When you watch early comedy, those are the kind of jokes like the the Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. So many of their jokes were similar to what you just said. Mm -hmm. And they're hilarious. You know, they're the they're kind of the foundation of where comedy has gone today. Although a lot of today's comedy is less charitable, I guess, to others (laughs) than early comedy was. Well, don't you think, too, like nowadays, it seems like everybody's got to be politically correct. So you hear a lot of comedians lamenting the fact that, you know, so many things are verboten and they're off limits because you can't talk about this. You can't say it this way, you know. Right. You've got to modify your comedy to the widest denomination of your audience because there's such a big mix. So, um, you know, I'm just kind of wondering while we're talking about that, is there a difference between doing comedy for a small group versus a large audience because I, you know, I went to see you once at John Lovitz's comedy club oh, that's at, right, on yeah. Universal City Walk, mm-hmm. and I know that's not there anymore. But that was a really big audience that you were performing for. So, do you notice a difference in what you can say or the atmosphere between smaller crowds versus these larger crowds? Oh yeah, when you hear that rush of laughter come back at you, it's pretty. What's the word? Intoxicating, I guess. 
you know. Uh huh. So, and then smaller crowds, you know, what I do is I just see because I'm doing a lot of different kind of venues right now, and I do a lot of senior things. So if I can just see a smile, you know, you might not get like a guffaw, you might just get a chortle. Don't you love these comedic terms, guffaw and chortle? You know, snicker. Yes. What else is there? <laughs> So yeah, there's Giggle, a slight, there's a difference. A sigh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to play this thing. I've got a hundred buttons of sounds, but they're not playing. So I never mind. This won't work. Oh no! Keep trying. Keep I trying. Won't. They might work at some point. Yeah. Because yeah, you and I had some. It's uh, like. Yeah, it's like the technical difficulties. Exactly what you were about we to just, say. We just had. Yeah, we just had a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, where were we? With the comedy stuff. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I was teaching school, when your daughter was in my class, that's what I delighted in the most was just like hearing that laughter come back at me from these kids. And they were just so cute. And some of these jokes are so old that I would tell, you know. (laughs) But I thought they were still funny, you know. And then these kids ran them for the first time. And it's like, it's interesting. I would always find that the kids that were like a little bit more intelligent got the jokes. And I don't want, I'm probably going to step on somebody's toes by saying some kids are more intelligent than others, but hey, let's face it, some kids are, because <laughs> I know, I mean, you know, let's be honest about it, you know, I wasn't the brightest bulb on the tree when I was a kid, you know, but hopefully I've come along. Yeah, I think it's your perspective on the world, you know, mm-hmm, like some right. kids are, are definitely going to get it right, and others are not, and um I was just about to ask you something that had to do with that, but then I started laughing and I lost it. See? Well, no, see, you and I, you and I are two of a kind because you and I are both these kind of like, you know, we have the attention span of a gnat. <laughs> you know, you're like, you know. Exactly. You know, and I'm, I'm feeding, I'm feeding the fire with you. You know, and you're throwing stuff at me. We're just like, <laughs> We're not going to get anywhere with this, Phil, so let's just... <laughs> it's it's not going to go no, anywhere. Just... I'm constantly talking about my ADD with Sophie, That's you it. know, and she's... It, it's it's really bad sometimes. She's like, I can't stand it, Mom. And I'm like, I'm wow. sorry. I'm Is sorry. that right? Yeah. You know, and then it takes me a little while to get back to where I was. But um, so you went to school to be a teacher. You didn't start out wanting to be a musician and a comedian and a writer, or is that? Oh, no, no, no. It's the other way oh. other way around. I, I've been playing guitar since I was like 10 years old, you know, like growing up back east. But, well, you know, big Italian Catholic family. My cousin was nine months older than me. So he got the accordion and I lucked into the guitar. So we would sing and, you know, at these little uh, altar society things or like, you know, like at the, our parents would get us these gigs and, you know, singing for a bunch of old ladies, you know, and we would sing in Italian and then we'd sing in English. And we were these two cute little boys. And then we graduated on, he went to the drums and I went, stayed with the guitar and then the high school bands came out, Beatles started playing. I said, oh my God, this is the ticket. So it just went from there and then college, Penn State University, you know, I had my band there, Sweet Pain. And then we just went from there and it's like, you know, I'll never forget. I'll tell you a quick little anecdote. Yeah. It was probably like, um, I don't know, I, I think I was maybe like, I was in high school and I couldn't drive. So my dad had to take me to this gig. It was on Route 51 outside of uh, Uniontown, Pennsylvania, which is in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania, down by Morgantown, West Virginia. And there was this place called Tucker's Tavern. And it was right on the side of the road. And this place was really interesting because, you know, it, it was like this typical roadside bar. And imagine a huge sign that said Tucker's, okay? And it was constantly being painted. Some, you know, person would come by and change the T to an F. <laughs> You know, and they would always have to repaint the sign. And it was notorious for that. And you walked inside, so this is like this is like the late sixties, and they had a big sign that said color TV. Now here's what the color TV was. The color TV was a regular TV, and across the top was a red strip of saran wrap, and then a green strip of saran wrap, and a blue strip of saran wrap right across the screen. That was their color TV. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it was a black and white TV, but they put this color film on it to make it look like it was color. So you're watching the TV. And you know, you're watching some guy and his head is yellow and his pants are blue <laughs> and his shoes are red. And, it was just like, and but anyway, in between it, is purple, right? Where that blue and the red cross over. <laughs> yeah. And, it's, and, and this was like a typical bar, you know, like a bar and grill and there's the bars there and it's, it smells like beer and oh, whatever gosh. it was, cigarettes. And right there on the bar is this huge thing of uh, deviled eggs. And I went in there and it was New Year's Eve and we were, when we played, at New Year's Eve, I'll never forget this. And I got ten dollars, and I thought these people are paying me to play this guitar. I said, "Oh my God, I can't believe this! Is, I've died and gone to heaven. This is all I ever want to do." You know, it was just like the greatest. Oh, that's so awesome! That's so yeah. 
funny. Oh my gosh. I mean, so much about that is funny. You did luck out getting the accordion, uh, the, the guitar instead of the accordion. Mm. <laughs> right. When I was a kid, my mom insisted that I was going to take these music lessons and mm-hmm. she chose the instrument and that's what she chose was an accordion for me. And I, I think I was about six or seven years old and I'd have to lug this heavy oh, yeah. instrument around, you know, it was, it was weighing me down on one side. So, you know, I'd walk with one hand on my hip to support mm-hmm. the other side. And it was, it was ridiculous. And in the summertime, when I was playing it, you know, you sit down, you're wearing shorts and the bellows would pinch the top of my thighs. And <laughs> I just, where are you, from? wait, where are you from originally? You're from like, uh, Central America? My family is, yeah, they're from Costa That's Rica. What I was wondering, yeah, because you guys, yeah, you guys went there visiting last. I saw you on Facebook, right? Weren't you visiting? We did. Last year? I took Sophie last year, and we got there right smack in the middle of a tropical storm. I mean, you think that the rain that we had over New Year's Eve was crazy here? Because that that was definitely a lot of rain. But we were out there, mm-hmm. and whole towns flooded while we were there. Oh my God. We almost got stuck in one of those floods and we had just gotten out. We're looking out at the rear of the van, this tour van that we were on and they're Uh pulling barricades across the roads right behind us. And then we got, we got on the main road and it was beautiful. We were going through the rainforest and it was just gorgeous. And there's all of these waterfalls just pouring off of the the mountainsides there as we're going through and i'm just going wow this is so pretty look at this waterfall roll down the window i want to take some video (laughs) and the driver's like white knuckling it through there and he's like this is not normal i'm like what do you mean it's not normal he's like we could get stuck in a flash flood like the levee could break and we could get washed away i didn't realize how dangerous it was it was just gorgeous though so, uh, yeah, funny. we were just in, in Central America. And so I guess that music, you know, accordion music is very popular in Spanish songs. So that's what my mom mm-hmm. wanted me to play. And I absolutely hated it. And I think it kind of turned me mm-hmm. off to to learning other instruments. But I can see why your cousin would want to graduate to drums <laughs> after that. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. Another one of my cousins pl- played the keyboard, then he moved to the organ. So. Yeah, a bunch of cousins playing music together. So go ahead. Oh, you're gonna say how something. fun. So all of the cousins were in a band called mm-hmm. Sweet Pain. Well, there were just me and my cousin Joe. And okay. we had some other friends in the band. Yeah. And, and why did you um, name it Sweet Pain? You know, it's funny. I was in, it was in a college class. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, too. You know, college class. I'm like, maybe like, what, 19, 20, 21, 22. And, um, I needed a name for the band. And Sweet Pain was the closest thing I could think of to an orgasm. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Can I say that on the, on the air? Here, you Absolutely. Know, and I thought, that is that is descriptive. And I remember sitting in a class that was at the Forum at Penn State University. And I think I might have been high at the time because it was just this <laughs> statistics class. And I hated statistics. I wasn't any good at it. I had to uh, take it like three times. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. And it was like, yeah, and I came up with a name. I thought, That's a great name for a band, man. Yeah, really cool. So anyway, see, now you know Whoa. the little known secrets. That's the name of the band, where it came from. That yeah. is awesome. That's totally mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. You're getting all this out of me, so you're taking, you know, oh, God. Now everybody knows. Yeah, you're revealing these secrets. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of music was Sweet Pain? We were like a bar band. We were like your classic um, oh my God, we played, we, well, you know, it's interesting. We played a lot of, you know, that part of Pennsylvania where I'm from was like, and it still is it's like, it's really kind of a, a soulful mix. We didn't play like this kind of California stuff, like, you know, the Eagles and, you know, Seals and Croft and stuff back then. We played like, you know, Four Tops and Temptations, uh, Sam and Dave, all that kind of, you know, mm. R, R&B stuff of the time then. Yeah, it was all dance music, you know, Sly Stone and Stevie Wonder and all that stuff. Oh, fun. And, you know, yeah, that's really good music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Good and we were stuff. like the happening bar band back then. I'll tell you. Wow, ten dollars. Now was that a tip or that's what they paid you? That was what I paid. Everybody in the band made. I guess they made ten dollars. All I know is I got my ten dollars. That was, but that was high school. That was before uh, Sweet Pain. That was that band was called. I don't even know. Check out this lineup for the band. Are you ready? Okay, yes. you ready? 
Yes. This was with a different cousin. This was with, the first band I was telling you about was with Joe Sabatini. This was with another band with Ricky Sacconi, two of my cousins. How do you like these names? Ricky Sacconi, Joe Sabatini, right? Bunch of I love it. They're rock star godfather names. <laughs> so this band, this, this what this band consisted of, and this is this band I was telling you about at the Tucker's Tavern. A drummer, two guitars, and two accordions. That was the band. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know. Wow, doesn't that sound <laughs> Two guitars, oh, two accordions, and a drummer. Mm-hmm. I bet mm-hmm. that sounded really interesting. <laughs> I can't imagine what it I have no recollection of what it sounded like. Oh, but people came to see it, right? <laughs> well, they were there. You know, it's a bunch of drunks, you know, on a New Year's Eve. <laughs> you know. So it's funny, huh? Oh, God. That is awesome. That's so awesome. The fact that we're doing this a couple of days after New Year's Eve, and this is so many years ago. You know, so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, what a great memory. Just being on stage at such a young age and getting that kind of attention just kind of sets you up to being able to get on stage for stand-up. Or at what point did you decide that you were going to go on stage and do stand-up comedy? That's a great question because you know what I always recall, and this is this is something you might find of interest. When I would play music, you know, um, I would play a song and then I would want to engage with the audience. I would want to talk to them. So I found that, and this is very something I noticed over the years, a lot of comedians want to be musicians. A lot of musicians wanted to be comedians, like, you know, like people like, oh, um, Richard Belzer, he would play harmonica in his act, or, you know, Robin Williams, he would do some music as well. And other people I've noticed over the years, so that seemed to be, see that um, kind of crossover thing. But I always wanted, I loved, you know, playing the music, but then in between the interstitial stuff, I just wanted to talk to the audience and banter with them and, you know, say stupid, funny things I thought, you know, were. (laughs) <laughs> on my mind at the time, you know, so that's kind of where it started from. And then the initial, well, you've seen me do my stand up. I use the guitar sometimes, right? you know, it's a part of it. So it was just a natural offshoot, you know, to use the guitar. Uh, when I first came to California, I took a class with uh, Stanley Myron Handelman. I don't know if you remember him or not. He was on the Ed Sullivan show. And he did like, a, he looked like, he was like an Arnold, you remember Arnold Stang, these guys that were like kind of, um, kind of more meekish kind of Jewish kind of comedians. And mm-hmm. they talked real kind of, you know, like this kind of thing, you know. And um, Stanley Myron Handelman was pretty famous. He'd been on the Ed Sullivan show and all these things. So I took a stand-up class with him. Then I did my, my debut at the Improv in, uh, up there. And I just kind of got hooked on it. I thought, man, this is what I want to do. And this was like in the uh, beginning of the 80s when it was really started, you know, burgeoning out here. And everybody was doing stand-up comedy. And it was so many clubs opening. So I would do it anywhere I could. I remember just like going into a place like I used to do a lot of like Al-Anon bar. Um, you're familiar with Al-Anon, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous. They would have their Friday meetings. And I would say to the guy, I say, can we come in here on Friday? I'll bring about five comedians. We'll do some stand-up comedy. And you know what's funny? <laughs> I did it at this bar in San Pedro. Remember Mule's Bar up there by where Trader Joe's is? Yes. It was called Mule's. I mean, it was this kind of longshore bar, you know. Oh my God. And it was a rough crowd. And I went in there and I'll never forget. I went in there and talked to this guy named was Red. He was a great guy. I said, Hey, I said, I like to do a stand up comedy act. And he goes, Stand up comedy. He goes, We have music here. We don't have comedy. I said, Let's just try it. So I remember walking out that day and some of the patrons were going, You better be funny. Oh <laughs> so, my gosh. Because imagine, you know, you're, it's like, you know, if they don't laugh, you know, it's going to it get ugly, you know. Exactly. But I, I, yeah, I brought in a good troop of comedians, and we had a great time. We had some great shows at Mules. And in fact, he made these T-shirts up saying, you know, Justin Ezzy's comedy show, blah, 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 and gave me a, a hat and a T-shirt that he made. And we, we were having a great time there for a while. How and then he ended fun. up selling the place. So, yeah. But anyway, to, make the, to answer your question is uh, I would go out and seek any kind of place where there would be an audience, you know, coffee shops, uh, bars, anything. I, I remember doing it in, in churches a couple of times, like right on the altar. At a place up in PV, you know, mm-hmm. somebody wanted comedy there. So we did it there. Oh know, my gosh. Another, yeah. And it's funny. Yesterday I was looking through a bunch of old papers and I found this list of 50 comedians that I had friends of mine at the time. And it was like these guys I would call us. Oh man, I wonder if these guys were still around, you know, you should reach out to them. That would be really yeah. awesome to do a reunion, just a big mm-hmm. laugh-a-thon. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think That's that would be idea. great. Um, yeah. So when you're going to, say, a bar that, you know, just has a lot of people who are there, like, to drink and have a good time, mm-hmm. and they don't really want to be bothered with the sound, I, and, right. and I'm going to just interject that with a little story. Sophie and I had gone out to dinner at a local restaurant here, and on 
that night while we were at dinner, they were playing some game and it was really loud and it was like, diners would have to run up and I don't remember exactly what the game was. I just remember that it was not what I was there for. (laughs) And we were very, very annoyed, you know? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I can kind of understand what you were saying when you went into mules and people going, you better be funny because I'm here to have a good time. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. so when you're going into a place like that versus doing comedy on the altar at a church, how do you <laughs> modify your jokes and your approach? Well, yeah, well, that's true because like, yeah, at the church, you obviously had to be very clean, you know, and, you know, aware of what people were into. And then at mules, it didn't matter if you took it into the toilet, you know, cause that's what they wanted to hear anyway. So, but I know what you're saying about that. Uh, I can remember playing a, perform in some places at, at bars and it's like a sports bar. So they, one place I was at in Orange County, they had like maybe six televisions all around me with a different game on. And I'm on this stage and I'm trying to like, you know, get these people involved in what yeah. I'm saying. Meanwhile, they're watching these sporting events. They don't care what I'm talking about. You know, maybe, maybe one or two people in the whole thing, the whole bar, they, some, of the, <laughs> some of the games just are like, just really kind of, I'm trying to forget them. <laughs> they were so bad, but I mean, you know, it was just at the time you just did what you had to do, you know? So yeah, that's mm-hmm. serious competition to have six different sports going on oh at a sports God. bar because that's what yeah. people go there for. Do you have a worst story? <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that. Uh, well, I was performing someplace. Yeah, this was down in Orange County. And I, I wasn't on stage at the time. I was in the show. And a woman actually died during the show. She just like, you know, oh my God. one of the comedians, oh said, she died. I mean, right there, she just kind of was sitting in a chair. It was a little kind of coffee shop place or something like that. Apparently she had a heart attack right there on the floor and just died right there. And then they had to call the paramedics in and everybody, you know, that was the end of the show, obviously. Oh my gosh. Did she die laughing? Yeah. She was sitting there with one other woman. And I would think, I would hope that comedian would say, you know, I really killed, but that's not funny. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> going into black comedy here. Um, oh, so yeah. she was with somebody and wow, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I'm sure if I think about it, there could be more I could come up with, but um, I can't think of anything right now. Oh my God. I wish I'm on the spot. I'm, we'll have to do it again. Once I'll, I'll kind of yeah. try to recap some of these and I've got friends that I'm sure have a better memory than I do. Oh, I kind of remember. Oh yeah. That one time when as he really stung. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure there's a lot more. What about a best story or or just a surprising oh. story where something just, you know, turned out so much better than you thought it would? Oh, uh, well, that that would have to be with some of those shows we had at the Warner Grand Annex, you know, where like everybody came out and we just had a blast. I mean, you were there for a couple of them, I'm sure. Comedy is not yeah. just for kids. That's right. That's exactly what it was. And I'm telling you, man, we had such a great turnout and all my friends and people were there. That was just the front of the, probably one of the big highlights, you know. And then where else did I? Oh, you know what else? I don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, mm-hmm. Reader's Digest had a contest. They used to run this contest called Tell Us a Joke Contest. And um, I won I won the contest. So they flew me to New York City and I performed at, oh, wow. at uh, the Gotham Comedy Club with Jim Gaffigan and Carolyn Rhea. This one joke that I told, you know, so it was, it was a fundraiser for uh, St. Jude's Hospital. Marlo Thomas was there and all these people from the Sopranos because that's when the Sopranos was real big and all these celebrities. So that was kind of a high point, too. They you know flew us out to New York and put us in a hotel and fed us and everything. It was great. <laughs> How exciting. Yeah, wow. Was, that's when I was at Park Western and I. You know, I got the word that I won, and you know, I was had to tell Chris Cassidy. You remember Chris? Yes, I said, yes. Chris, I'm, have to, I'm gonna have to take a couple of days off, and she was supporting. She was, she was good about it, you know. Oh, she was such a wonderful person. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really sad she passed away this last year. That's so, right. um, another one we lost. She's. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. she was a good one, and yep. definitely some very warm, fond memories of her. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Wow. That is really so exciting that you got to do that. And mm-hmm. that was, that must've been a really big crowd. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I think they, they might've televised it too. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, that was a blast. That was a high point. 
How exciting. Um, mm-hmm. Since we were talking about comedy is not just for kids over at the Warner Grant, and that also was such a big crowd because it was standing room only every mm-hmm. year that I went. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that you really got a good turnout and you had some really good comedians. Was that your brainchild to put that together? And Because uh, I know that these events are a lot of work. Yep. That was what it was. And it's funny because um, it was the same idea where like I went in there and I said, Hey, I want to put on a comedy show. <laughs> Let's put on a show. <laughs> and that's, they went with it. And I did the whole thing. I mean, I, you know, rented the room and I took the, the risk because the room cost a lot of money to rent that room, you know, but I, you know, yeah. I was hopeful. And I put the flyers together and the flyers back in those days cost a lot of money. You know, so, yeah, that worked out really well. I was happy about that. Yeah. Are you still doing that? Are you still I haven't done putting that together? I'm just too busy with the music now because what I've been doing musically is uh, I won this song contest last year for my well, comedy song called Thicker in the Middle, Thinner on Top. I think you know about that, right? Yep. So I've been trying to do more of these custom songs for um, certain life events. And interesting enough, we're talking about Chris. I did one for her. I did like three songs for people that died last year. And I did one for my cousin's 75th birthday and one for a baby being born, another person had a baby born so i did this song for them and so i'm just really into these fun things that i'm just doing writing these songs that are kind of funny that are you know humorous as well they bring some levity to you know a situation that's not necessarily oh i, I did this a couple of weeks ago i was did one for a friend of mine who passed away and his daughter was at the house and the daughter said thank you so much for bringing us a smile on a day where it's like so sad they were doing like one is called a celebration of life you know those things they do you know yeah. So I sang the song that I'd written for them and they were all laughing and smiling with me because it was like <laughs> really kind of inside stuff, you know, people that knew about him, you know, and then I did another one last week at the Mary and Joseph Retreat Center for another friend that passed away. So hopefully, you know, because that's what I just feel like still, it's like, yeah, here's a, here's an interesting question. And I think you're going to like this because this is the mm-hmm. kind of way I think you think too. Imagine you lived 1500 years ago. What profession would you be in? What would you do? What would you have? Can, does anything, anything pop to mind? 1500 years ago or a thousand years ago i feel like i would have always been this court jester or somebody that's like you know some kind of that's what i my, that's my thing in life is to go around and you know act stupid and make people laugh hopefully or share a song or something so i feel like this is what why i've been here but what would you be 1500 years ago what do you think what what would you be doing oh my goodness i mean given given your I gifts would... now okay your gifts that you have yeah. you know what you have now what would you be doing I would probably be a philosopher Mm -hmm. or a writer, Mm -hmm. definitely an orator of some sort. But, you know, when I think back to those time periods, I always think, could I have been simply because you have to throw in the, you know, the being a woman. Mm, Right, 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 right. I didn't probably would have kept me. Yeah. You know, probably would have kept me from doing those things, but not necessarily. I mean, there's plenty of female writers from that time period. And then, you know, we find out that some of them went under pen names that oh, yeah. were masculine That's right. so that they could get their work out there. So I probably would have done something like that. I, I do really enjoy writing and I've been thinking about it a mm-hmm. lot lately that that is really my strongest form of communication. I put my point across so much more clearly through writing than I do when I'm talking. In fact, I I often feel like I'm tripping over my tongue. I'm not able to express my thoughts perfectly. And probably some of that is the ADD. Mm -hmm. Some of that is that I don't really think in words all of the time. Sometimes Mm. I think, and I don't know if this is what everybody does, but I think in pictures Mm. and I think in color Mm -hmm. and I think in just these very nebulous abstract um, images that come to me. And sometimes it's hard to put words to that, even Mm. though there are words associated with what I'm trying to express. And when I write, I'm able to express myself. I'm able to paint pictures with words and it it puts it together for me in a better way than speaking does. Wow. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. Cause remember we we were in that writer's group together. Remember that? Yeah. The writer's round table. Yeah. Wow. So that's good that you're still writing. I'm glad to hear that. Good. I am. I'm still Mm -hmm. writing. I'm doing mostly uh, screenplays. 
So right now I'm working on a Western series that's called Dark Country. And that's a lot of fun to work on because there's a lot of research associated with it. It's not a historical fiction piece, but there is a lot of historical people and events that occur during the 1800s or people who live during the 1800s that make appearances in this Western series. So, you know, we're learning how they spoke, how they lived, (laughs) what Mm -hmm. they ate, Mm -hmm. how they got their food together, you know, all of that. And it's a very scrappy, rough, difficult place to live. What was the the, the, the West? I mean, is that it it takes place in the West, but across the United States. So, you know, we have a story of a slave escaping Mississippi and mm-hmm. ending up in upstate New York. So mm-hmm. it does span across the United States uh, because, you know, New York was a, a non-slave state at the time. Mm-hmm. So that was a good escape. But then everybody ends up traveling West. Go West, young man. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. so... <laughs> So there's a lot of, you know, Wyatt Earp is in there and Doc Holliday and Pony Deal and a lot of the people that you hear about in the OK Corral, but it's not a story about the OK Corral. So we have other characters. Um, I think in film, they kind of tend to get ignored because they're not these primary characters where, you know, everybody's like, wow, the OK Corral was such a big event. You know, it was Mm -hmm. in the papers. People talk, people are still talking about it today. Mm -hmm. And you forget that other things were happening in the United States at the same time. And even, you know, right there in in Tombstone, Arizona. And so, so we're just bringing a lot of the feel of the 1800s across the United States at that time. Interesting. Together. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun, but I, I love writing. I love painting with words. Mm-hmm. I hear you. <laughs> and speaking of that, you ended up publishing a book called Wingo, mm-hmm. which is about right. a brave little dragon who um, I think like learns how to accept himself and his like unique traits. That's exactly what it was. Yep. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. I mean, cause I think in even a little early age kids, you know, you know, we all think that you see somebody that's like, you know, really popular or cute and you think, well, I got to be like them. You know, I got to look like them, dress like them, act like them, you know? So I always wanted to try to convey that to kids because I've always felt that way as well. You know, we're all subject to it, I guess. Right. You know, the pressures. That of, awkwardness. Exactly. Story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a story of everybody's life. I'm always uh-huh. like, oh, I can't talk. Mm-hmm. I can't act. I don't know what to do. You know, I was just at a New Year's Eve party. And even though I know everybody who was there, you know, a couple of times somebody would ask me something and I would just freeze. And uh, I don't even know what to say. Okay, I'm going to say this. And then it was like, no, that's not what I meant to say. Oh, <laughs> you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. You get so awkward. Mm-hmm. That's what alcohol's for, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, speaking of that. <laughs> oh, what happened? Um. A lot of the people who came brought some really cool things. So this is at what my girlfriend Brooks place and um, she puts these parties together and, and brings some super fabulous people together and everybody brings something homemade. So it's always really great food. This year I brought a shrub that I did not make, but it's a drinking vinegar and it was dandelion and ginger shrub. Wait a minute. Back up, back up. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, shrub yeah. is a drink. Is, is that what you're saying? It's called a shrub. It is. I never it's heard of this. It's called a shrub, like the plant. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's very old fashioned and they're pretty easy to make. And I got this one at a Native American event that I went to and they gave us some swag bags at the end and these bottles were in there. And I was like, whoa, what do I do with this? And you, you can mix them just with mineral water and they're delicious, but we got some fancy vodka and mineral water and this delicious shrub and made some fancy cocktails with them. And then one of our friends, Jenna made homemade elderflower wine. Oh my God. And then Wade, one of the other guys there made a banana whiskey. That was very strong. (laughs) I had a little sip of it. Um, it was it was really strong, but it was good. It tasted like bananas. So those were some of the homemade offerings that were brought this year. 
this Banana time whiskey. Around. Oh my God. I never heard. Now, right? wait, tell me what's in a shrub vinegar. What is it? It's um, it's considered a drinking vinegar, and so it, it doesn't ferment, so there's no alcohol in it, but it was, I think it's just like water, fruit, herbs, and sugar. Uh-huh. And, you, you know, you macerate everything together and kind of let it all infuse, all of those different flavors infuse. And I found a recipe online. Apparently, it's really easy to make them with berries, like summertime shrubs. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to try to wow. make a couple of them. Well, I want to thank you for that word because I love words, and, and I never had never heard that term "shrub" for like a alcohol or like a, for a drink. I love that. Oh, right. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they taste really good, and they're just refreshing, you know. So, mm-hmm. and it's good that they don't have to be alcoholic. But mm-hmm. yeah, you know that that awkwardness that you were talking about. I think we all just run into it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, getting getting too much into our heads. So with that thought that, you know, when, and I think that that is when awkwardness happens is when you start listening to yourself. And, you know, I used to produce storytelling events for a while. And one of the things that I noticed about getting on stage and entertaining people is that you kind of have to get out of your way. You exactly. have to... Mm-hmm. Stop listening to yourself, right? Exactly. Because once you start listening to yourself, that's when you're pausing and hesitating and mm-hmm. stammering and, and it everything changes and you start to become awkward. Mm-hmm. So what I would tell anybody who wanted to be one of the storytellers, like practice, practice, practice until you stop listening to your story and you start entertaining the audience. How hard is that for you to do? I mean, I, you know, obviously you're on stage all the time, but is that something that you had to learn to do? Well, that's or a good point. How do you prepare to get on stage? To this day, if I'm playing at a place or working someplace or performing wherever I am, and there's like a mirror in the room, which happens often, you know, sometimes there may be a mirror, and I get in front of the mirror and I see myself and I realize what I'm doing, it just the whole thing goes away because then I then I'm focused on myself and not I'm focused on what these people are, you know, or where are they? And like you said, you know, the whole it's a whole paradigm shift from like as opposed to like what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to convey or trying to you know reach these people. It also it becomes about me. I start thinking about oh what, what I look like, or what I sound like, you know, what I'm doing, you know, and it's just oh it's the, it's the death knell for me. I can't do that, you know. Right. You got to get out of your like you said, get out of your own way, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It. And um, I, I think that that's what it is, yeah. getting in your head too much. Mm-hmm. You've written two albums, actually. We just uh, mentioned Thicker in the Middle, Thinner on Top. Mm-hmm. And you also have Summerland. Well, Summerland was the first album, yeah. And it's so funny because uh-huh. it's on the internet. I mean, you can hear it. It's on like Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, and YouTube. And it's funny because when I put it on there, they screwed up the titles. So all the titles are wrong for the songs. There's one song called Out With The Boys. Oh, no. Yeah, and it's all screwed up. And rather than go back and do it over again, I just said, you know, I'll just leave it the way it is because it was just too much of a hassle. But <laughs> uh, I'm doing all this comedy stuff now, which is kind of funny because when somebody heard my album years ago, they go, they said to me, you're like really sad, aren't you? <laughs> I said, what? They go, yeah, you're like, your songs oh. are like really sad. And I thought, you know, you're right. A lot of the songs I wrote back then were like really kind of, because it's easier to write a song like that. It's easier to write a song about some heartfelt emotion and breakup. You know, most songwriters will tell you that, you know, it's harder to write like a happy song, you know, or a fun song. Because, you know, like a lot of the emotion comes out of like, you know, a sad breakup or something like that. And there's all this angst going on, you know, <sighs> so... Yeah, well, they're really high impact events, right? Mm -hmm. You carry that stuff, you know, you break up with somebody and Mm -hmm. even years later, you're over them, but you think it's still affecting you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are those are a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. I always say that the negative events, these high impact events that really affect us, they're big. And they're few and far between. I mean, like, it's not like you're having a tragedy every single day, but Mm -hmm. the tragedies are so big that they affect you for a long time. Mm -hmm. But the good things are like glitter. They're falling Mm -hmm. around us all the time. They're very small Mm -hmm. and bright and they're there, but it's kind of, you know, like you you have to look for it because it's so ubiquitous that, you know, you have to actually stop and say, I'm grateful I'm talking to my friend as he, I'm grateful that, we got the connection working today. I'm grateful that I'm in a nice studio doing this in my own home Mm -hmm. and, you know, so on and so forth. But you have to like, 
because it, it just all kind of is the glitter just is there all the time. Like good air is there for us to breathe. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to notice it. You have to be mindful. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. That glitter idea is really, that's really pretty cool. That's, that's really neat. I like that a lot. I'm going to use that. Can I use that? (laughs) Absolutely. Please do. Now you speaking of that, you're hit on a certain certain thing that we had in common. Remember those t-shirts that I made? In fact, I have a picture right now I'm looking at when we took the picture outside in front with all these kids wearing the shirts with freedom comes responsibility. responsibility. And what was on the back of that? The attitude of gratitude. On the back of on the back of the sheet shows we have the attitude of gratitude. And I've got that picture, and Sophie's in the picture right here. Look, I'm looking at her right now. <laughs> with all those kids, remember there was like mostly girls, right? And we we're all standing in front yes. of the mural at Park Western. Oh my that God. was such a happy. You know, that's the thing when when you had all the kids that were fortunate enough to go through your class were really some of the happiest, most cheerful, united kids. Like you created oh, community you. for those yeah, kids. I'm, I'm yeah. looking at this picture. I'm thinking you took it. I did. Did you take it? Yeah. Okay. I did. Okay. Sophie's on the end. Yeah. She's on the far end. Yeah. We're in front of that mural. Oh my gosh. And all the girls are wearing, yes, they're all girls and they're all wearing this with freedom comes responsibility shirts. How many are there? Like one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. By 16 girl. Wow. And you took that picture. That's so cool. Yeah. I took that picture. I, I worked there at the time. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, that was a, a really wonderful time. And and I did. I, I just love the community that was built at that school in general, but definitely from your classes. How did you approach teaching a group of kids that were all, you know, for the most part, strangers to each other Mm -hmm. and building that into a community where they became friends and and not just friends, but helpful to one another and supportive of each other? Well, that was always a challenge because, you know, you would, you know, it's like the squeaky wheel gets most of the the grease is what they say, you know, like, and you know, mm-hmm. like your daughter was great. You know, she didn't cause any problems, but there always be some kids that, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, and they, they always get all the attention because those, those are the ones you remember, you know? So building the community, that was a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. That's really good. I don't know how, how we did it. It was just like, but like you said, there was just such a special group of people back at the time. In fact, recently, ever since Chris Cassidy's passing, I've been in contact with people and I'm just commenting on the fact that we had just, you know, certain things happen throughout life and you, you just strike gold. And that's what we uh-huh. had there for a brief period of time, you know, and that, that stuff doesn't last, as you know, things move right. on, but we had it, you know, we captured uh, lightning in a bottle, so to speak there for a brief period of time, you know, and we just, it worked. Oh yeah. You know? Not perfect, but you know, it was there. It was a it. really special And I'm looking at this time. picture of Sophie right now and she's, she's on the end. And she looks so like shy, like she doesn't want to be in this picture. <laughs> Probably because her mom's taking the picture. You should see this. You know this picture I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Oh, she's got this look on her face. It's just like, she's like, oh, mom. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> She probably was, you know, oh my God, is she going to take a picture of us now? Uh What's she doing now? (laughs) Where is she now? She is studying environmental science with an emphasis in marine biology. Mm -hmm. And so she's getting ready to graduate in the spring. You know, so I'm looking forward to her finishing her degree and what she wants to do. She's always been really interested in marine science. I mean, she was going to the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium since she was four years old and, Mm. you know, became a docent and a coastal park naturalist and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, she's just continued on from there. Great. And, Mm. you know, a lot of the lessons that you taught in the class were marine oriented and definitely environmentally friendly. I remember collecting milk jugs. Oh my God, you're right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and we did that whole thing, that video, It's which is on, you know, you can go to my YouTube channel, J-T-E-Z-Z-I, and you can see that where, yeah, we collected all those milk jugs and we, it was showed like what one person uses, how much water one person uses in a day. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Go to my YouTube channel, J-T-E-Z-Z-I, and you'll see it. Yeah, that's great. I forgot all about that. That was really significant, and it really gave the kids a visual Mm -hmm. connection to what's going on in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with water nowadays, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then just collecting all of those jugs. I mean, that was a serious effort Mm -hmm. to be able to get that many. You know, so um, yeah, good for you. That was pretty awesome. So you've written the two albums, a book. And lots of comedy and now these very special legacy type custom songs. Mm -hmm. 
where does the muse come from? You know, it's funny for the longest time. I, and I've got like so many songs that I'm trying to finish, but I find that if I have a deadline, I just, it just comes up and I don't know, it, it might not be perfect, but at least I got something out there, you know, cause that's, the, that's another problem. I'm sure you deal with as well as a creative person that like, oh, it's not good enough. I got to do it over again, you know, and right. I wrestle with that all the time. But if I've got a deadline, I'll just put ever whatever, throw it up against the fence and see whatever sticks. And that seems to be working. So just, I'm going to keep going with that. Wow. That's really great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I do that a lot. Don't you find that like if you, if you got a deadline, you know, Right. I mean, the muse comes to you as opposed to like waiting for it to hit because it's not going to happen unless you. Right. I don't know if you found that the case. Right. No, I have. You know, we have a, a writer's group associated with this project, Dark Country. And it's like, OK, well, we've got to get these scenes completed. Mm-hmm. And what usually happens in a writer's group is somebody will either take a character or they'll take a scene and then everybody comes together with their characters and their scenes and puts them together mm-hmm. in a meeting. And whenever that happens, it's like, okay, let's just get this out. And when I'm dedicating my time to writing like that and really committed to the group effort, I do notice that it just kind of flows. And you know, I know that that might be upsetting for some people to hear, but that happens to be my gift. Just like, you know, when, when I hear somebody singing and they go, oh, you know, I just naturally have always sung like this. It's like, wow, mm-hmm. because I can't sing. So, I, you know, we all have talents. Um, but if I am under that kind of time frame and obligation that, you know, I need to be present and I need to be responsible for my part so that everybody can have that result at the end with, that we're looking for, which is to have a completed scene. I, I get it out on the paper mm-hmm. and it looks good. When I'm really super worried about, oh, this has to be perfect. It's very stagnated mm-hmm. the way that it comes out. And I'm getting up every few minutes and going, okay, well, what's in the fridge? Or maybe I should be <laughs> yeah, watching something. Or let me scroll through my phone, oh, you know, God, because no. it's painful to write. Yeah, it is. It's right. It's you're right. <laughs> you know. You know what's funny? I that I've started doing now. I get up in the morning and I just try to do all my work first before I start looking at any kind of email because that's like. You know, you, don't you find that if you start looking at email, next thing you know, it's the day's gone and you didn't do anything. You know, it's God, so so much stimulation. Yeah. You know? So I should do that more because uh, right now I haven't been doing a lot of scrolling, but I've been doing a lot of. I use Duolingo to learn Korean mm-hmm. and and Rosetta Stone and some podcasts and some videos and all of that. And if I get on Duolingo, because it, it's stylized like a game, like a video mm-hmm. game. And so it's great for learning languages because it, it'll it sh- throw a letter at you and you need to know what that letter is. So now you're learning, you're learning the letters or the words and the sounds and all of that that's coming with them. But you also get to level up and then they have all of these people who are trying to also learn the language that you're trying to learn. And it'll say, you know, oh, you're number three and there's these two people and, you know, the second position is only 30 points higher than you and the first position is only 60 points higher than you. You're like, I'm not going to stop until Mm -hmm. I get first position. And, you know, and then a lot of the day does go by. I mean, it's educational because I'm starting to get to the point where I can speak it. And I definitely can write it and I'm understanding the structure, sentence structure and and word structure by syllables, but I'm spending a lot of time doing that because it's, it's competitive at the same time. And that's kind of addictive, you know? Mm, Yeah. See, I'm not, I'm not that competitive. It's interesting. I've never been, you know, it's funny speaking of sports, you know, most men have a sports gene and to be honest with you, when I was in mm-hmm. high school, I was too short to play basketball, too small to play football, too slow to play baseball, but I still got athlete's foot. <laughs> I wanted to ask you two more things real quick. What are you doing these days? And the second thing is, where can people see you, listen to your music, and find your books? Or get a hold of you. I'm like the senior of the senior set. I play at most of these places around in Palos Verdes, Torrance, and in the South Bay area. And I just love it because I'm around these people that have had these illustrious lives. I mean, some of these people I meet 
and I play in these memory care units as well. And it's just such a gift to be around these people. A lot of them are like no longer ambulatory and you know, some have dementia and Alzheimer's, but the music is such a conduit and it's just being there with them. It's just such a gift for me. And I just, I, I feel blessed to be there with these people, you know, and oftentimes, mm-hmm. you know, you might not even get more than a nod or a smile or a tapping toe or even that from some people, but I feel like that's what God put me on this earth to do is just to try to reach people in some way. So again, I, I feel blessed. And that's what I'm doing a lot of. Mm-hmm. And then um, musically, my band was playing at the Black Angus in Torrance. We did a couple of dates there um, and we'll be, probably be back there soon. And, but um, the thicker in the middle, thinner on top is on uh, Spotify iTunes, Pandora, and YouTube Music, so they can hear it there. Plus, my YouTube channel, JTEZZI, is a blast, too, because it has all those kids' videos on there. Oh, I, I, did, you, did you ever see the video I did with uh, Please Wear Your Mask? When the pandemic struck two years ago, over two years ago, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to write this song about Please Wear Your Mask. So I wrote this song, and then had another friend of mine put a video to it. It's really cute, but that's on my YouTube channel, too, JTEZZI. Check that out because it's really cool. It's really fun. The video really works well. <laughs> How fun. I'll have that. to check it yeah. out. Do you have a website? I don't. I'm trying to put one together right now. I had one for the longest time and then um, I got rid of it because my wife keeps telling me, she goes, you got to get your website going. And, and I just went through GoDaddy and I kept my domain name and everything. So I got to get back on that. I'm just, I, honest to God, I'm looking at this door here. I have a, a door and there's like papers posted on the door like priorities because if i don't keep my priorities straight everything just goes to hell you know and next thing i know i'm yeah. like, you know, looking at a tree for an hour <laughs> that, yeah yeah no that's a good idea when i'm actually keeping a journal i i actually stick to those things but that always lasts for like a week or so for me <laughs> you know where i'm actually doing what i'm supposed to be doing and then i forget to journal and then it all goes away so uh-huh. um that's funny Good for you. I, maybe I should start the sticky note. Well, I just ignore them, you know. <laughs> right, I did it, you know, right, right, the right. Inten- I had the intention. You know, I tr- you know, I try to do, you know, what I'm supposed to do. Sticking with it. That's the difference, don't you think, between people that really kind of, you got to just stick with it every day and just do a little bit every day. Yeah. Yeah, just get in there, just show up and do a little bit every day and you'll make progress. Mm-hmm. So hopefully a lot of people will listen to this and maybe some creditors will come after me as well. Like, we found you. Invasive. Finally. You know, I've been trying to elude the law. See, I dug you out of the rubble <laughs> and you're back into the world. That's not true. You've been doing a lot for people and I really love that about Thank you. Thank you. That's sweet of you. You're welcome. If you had one thing to share with the world, what would it be? I, I just think it would be like a smile or a laugh, you know, just share. I would like to share a laugh with everybody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's always so great connecting with Ezzy. As he's widely known, he's such a great guy. And I hope that this episode inspires you to smile more, laugh more, and get silly more often. As Justin said, a smile is the shortest distance between others. Once Justin gets his website up and running, I'll post it on the socials. But in the meantime, please check out his YouTube channel at JTEzzy. All links will be in the show notes. Please also take a moment to rate this episode because your ratings really do help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I'm looking forward to sharing more upcoming In the Company of Friends talks with you. So please be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail Podcast. That's T H E. Q-U-A-I-N-T-R-E-L-L-E podcast. I am Sil Annan, the Queen Trail. And until next time, I wish you passion, grace, adventure, laughter, song, smiles, elegance, and beauty.